Woodblock Printmaker David Bull here, back with the next episode in our series of videos discussing the production of our reproduction of the Hokusai Great Wave Print. Immediately after uploading the previous episode, I began to work on this tracing in earnest, but while doing so, I continued to work on the research side of this project. I learned that the image that I was tracing, which had come to me as being from the Smithsonian Institution in America, was actually from the U.S. Library of Congress, which I thought was the same thing, but apparently not. The Library of Congress has more documentation on their website about the image, and it turns out to be not so old. Not Edo, not Meiji, it's actually only an early Showa copy, and it was apparently made by the Takamizawa Company, at that time one of the most respected publishers in the business. So I thought for a while I'd better put my tracing on hold, and I began to cast around to find something a bit earlier if I could. I chatted with Shinkichi Numabe, the man who was doing a lot of the printing for our Ukiyo Hero series, so to see what he might know. He's, uh, he's been working for 40 years or so, he's exactly my age, 63, and I thought he must have plenty of experience with the great wave design, and I was right, but in a way that I hadn't expected. <laughs> it turns out that he's the man who printed the copy that I chose as the bad example in last time's video. I quickly checked back to see what I had said about it in that video, but I'll stand by the point I made there. It wasn't badly printed. The problem lay in the publishing and carving side. Now that Namabe-san knows I'm doing a new version of this print, he's jumping up and down beside himself. He really wants to sign on and work on this one, following the same precepts that I do, to make a print with the best possible level of, of both the art and the craft. He's done fabulous work on the Heroes series for us, and accepting me as the publisher and absolute dictator of how they are made. And if he will do the same thing in this case, he'll be welcome to participate. Anyway, anyway, we'll handle that later when we get to the printing side. Back to the current situation, finding a better master copy. He told me that his Oyakata, the man from whom he had learned most of the craft many years ago, and who's now long dead, had worked on a reproduction of the Great Wave made from an original in the Metropolitan Museum. And he remembers, Numabe-san remembers, discussions back then that came to a conclusion that that particular copy was, if not the earliest original, then right back there as far as possible. They have the image online, so I downloaded it and began to inspect the work. And in a word, yes. Very nice cap character in the line work with excellent capture of the feeling of the brush strokes and beautiful, beautiful balance between the various blue tones. Anyway, I quickly made the switch. I tossed out the work I had done so far and began to trace again from scratch using that copy. And I had no sooner got started than I began to discover a number of very interesting things about this copy. Now, rather than sit here and tell you about all this stuff directly, I thought it would be interesting to take a different approach. I'm going to take the image and show it to my friend, Mr. Motoharu Asaka. Asaka-san is without question the most respected carver still at work in this field. He, just like Nubabi-san, is also exactly my age, 63, but unlike me, mostly self-trained, he came up through the ranks the old-fashioned way, beginning with an apprenticeship in a Kyoto workshop of the aforementioned Takamizawa company. For the past decade or so, he's been working independently and now runs his own workshop and training school. I think that not only will he be very interested in these things that I've been discovering, but he will almost certainly have some good input for the process. And we'll take this camera with me so you can eavesdrop on the conversation. Let's go. This is myself and Asuka-san, seated at a pair of carving benches in his workroom slash classroom. When he heard what I wanted to talk about, he went to his files and brought out a number of impressions of the great wave print that he has used in his work. So we had plenty of samples at hand to compare between. He told me that he himself has done this print twice. Once while working for Takamizawa when he was younger, and once later after becoming an independent carver. I should mention that he had nothing to do with the modern copy that I showed you in the previous video. Now, to the main point that I wanted to discuss with him. My inspection of the various images has led me to the conclusion that there has been a major change in the way that this print has been carved during the post-war period. All of the pre-war examples that I have studied seem to have the blue tones printed from three blocks. A faint blue, a medium blue, and the darkest level. And this darkest level makes up the individual wave curls as well as the body of the shadow of the wave underneath here. In contrast to this, the post-war prints use four blue blocks. The light and medium blues are the same, but the darkest blue is split into two. One block for those shadows and one block for the curls. This is completely backwards from a typical procedure where later versions of a print would use fewer blocks in order to save money. 
I think this happened because in comparison to the old days when a top carver would actually trace over an original with a brush, it became very common in the post-war period for carvers to work from monochrome photographic reproductions pasted onto the wood. And it's easy to see how a misunderstanding could arise in that circumstance. After I laid out the visual evidence for this to Askasan, he concurred that there did indeed seem to have been a major change and that all the older images we inspected were carved with three blue tones. But I had a stronger thesis I wanted to push forward. After very closely inspecting the metropolitan image, I think that it was indeed printed from what I believe is the original block set, and there's lots of evidence for that. Let's take some points in turn. Look here, do you see the small nick in one of the lines here? The carver worked just a little bit too quickly and carelessly, and when carving the horizontal stroke here, his knife bumped into the previous vertical stroke, leaving the nick. We see the same thing in a few more places here and there on this block. This print was not made as a careful reproduction of a famous print. This is exactly the kind of carving we would expect to see from a typical carver's workshop of the day, working on a typical print. Remember, the Great Wave was not famous at all when it was first made, and it was just another day's work. And look up here. Do you see the bump left on one side of this line? Again, the carver worked quite quickly and failed to notice that he had neglected to remove a sliver of waste wood. This happens to me fairly frequently. When I begin test printing, if I notice such places, I'm a carver too, so I get out my knife and trim them off. But in a typical printer's workshop of the old days, there was no carver there, because that work had been done in a separate shop. The printer just shrugged and kept printing. And look here, the calligraphy. This is an extremely telling point. The lettering is carved absolutely masterfully, and indeed, this was the first thing that Askasan looked at when I brought this image out. But look, right next to the beautiful lettering, the box surrounding it has been carved in an extremely clumsy manner. The lines waver in thickness and are nowhere near straight. Why? Simple. The top gun in the shop, the most advanced carver, would do the difficult parts, the lettering, the faces, and etc., and other younger people would then take the block and finish it off. Again, this is not the way that a careful reproduction, like mine, was made, but was exactly the standard method of working back in the old days. I showed all these things and a couple more to Askasan, and he nodded in general agreement. But you can't be sure you know, he emphasized, and I agreed. No, I cannot guarantee that the Metropolitan copy is from the original block set, but the evidence is certainly pointing in that direction. All of those small things are exactly against what a forger or later reproducer would do, and they seem to me to make up a pretty powerful argument. So that's where we stand at the moment. I'm certainly not convinced that the copy we're using is a masterwork carved by the highest level of carver, but again remember, back in the day, this was just another print being published as part of a long series, and there was no reason at all for the publisher to treat it with any special respect. The set of blocks was cut almost certainly by more than one man and probably took more than, no more than a few days in all. Get it done and get it out the door was their guiding principle, and it's a tribute to their consummate craftsmanship, in partner with Hokusai's brilliant inspiration, of course, that their work that week resulted in a masterpiece of human achievement. Anyway, more later. I, I myself now moving very, along very well with my tracing, and we're getting closer to the point where we can get the image out of this machine and down onto a piece of wood and get going. This has been a bit long, I'm sorry. Uh, do I still have time to show you some scenes from outdoors? Let's see. The other day when I took the camera outside, it was evening, and I showed you a few views of Sensoji, the famous temple. Today it's daytime, and look at this, the girl here. Today is Seijin Shiki. It's the ceremony, a coming of age ceremony, and at the local city hall just down the street from us, They've just finished the ceremony where all the people who became 20 years old last year get their coming-of-age certificates. They're allowed to vote, they're allowed to do anything in normal society, and of course, they're allowed to drink. There will be a party or two in town tonight. And in fact, I think as I stood here on the street, I could see that the parties have already started, that this next group coming along here, <laughs> they've had a little touch of the bottle already, I think. The phone in his right ear, and here you go, the phone in his left ear. Yep, that's the way things go for today's young adults. 